Hey Vito, what are you doing? Well, the Northern California Homebrewers Festival is in less than 48 hours and I have to carve that Dortmunder that we brewed so we can serve it. Well, probably a good time to have a discussion on carbonation. Let's do it. I think it's a perfect time to have a discussion on carbonation. And we've been teaching it for over 25 years now, and there's a good way of carbonating and a bad way of carbonating. None of it's right, none of it's wrong. But first, let's talk about the science of carbonation. Vito, what is carbonation? So yeah, we, we carbonated beer. We have a liquid, which is beer, and a gas, which is CO2. Uh, we're trying to put that CO2 into, you've probably heard, in solution. So we want CO2 in solution. Depending on your beer style, you're gonna have different carbonation levels. Um, and it, it's measured in bar. So you know, average finished beer is anywhere between 2.2 to 2.6. Uh, some styles like lambic and wheat beers are up around three bar. And that's the measurement of CO2 in solution. CO2 goes into solution at a lower temperature. So that the lower the temperature, and there's, there's charts that, that show you all this of how much you know, PSI and what temperature equals what bar or carbonation level of, uh, of beer. We'll link to a carbonation chart in the comments below. Yeah, we also have a uh, calculator online too. So you could select your beer style, say what the temperature of your beer is and hit go and it'll tell you what to set your PSI gauge to. And that's good too, because different beers, you know, uh, different finished gravities are affected by that gravity, how much sugar is left in there to how much CO2 you're gonna need to put on there. Yep. So let's go through, I, I say there's four different ways to carbonate your beer, is what I've always told people. And we'll start with the highest risk first. And that to me is put your regulator up to 25, 28 PSI cold and check it every six to eight hours. And then as you feel it's getting more and more carbonated, check it more frequently. I've had beers carbonate in 12 hours cold and sometimes 24 hours cold. But if you need it fast, that's one way of doing it. Next is what Vito was just doing, is kind of the same. You're cranking up that PSI, but then you're rolling it. And Vito, why did you have it on its side? So I had it on its side because I get more surface area. So that, that gas, you know, is able to, to have a larger surface area. And then the rolling of it, you know, exposes more liquid as I'm rolling it. So that, that pressure could bake its way into solution. Yes, it, 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 you know, as you're churning it, you are introducing more CO2 to the liquid. I do it a little differently or did it a little differently. I used my wife's exercise ball and I never liked it to be on its side. I didn't want beer to come out my CO2 lines. They didn't have great inline check valves back then. So I bounced it straight up and down on an exercise ball. Um, but same concept, you're agitating it. Some people will hit it with 20 PSI and take the CO2 off and shake it until, and then put it on again. There's just different ways, but essentially you're just, you know, um, upping your game by getting it more into solution. Do you remember the carb squatch? Talking yes. about agitating? Yes. Yeah. We used to sell a product that would rubber band to your product and just vibrate. And it did, it did help allow that CO2 to absorb faster. So the third way is using a carb stone. Vito, tell me how you do it in a brewery. So yeah, at the brewery, we use the carb stone. Uh, you know, we've got massive tanks. So the first thing you need to do is call, uh, find out what they call the watering level. So you put your carb stone, depending on, you know, we had, I think it was like a 12 inch carb stone in a bucket and turn up the PSI to find out what point bubbles start to come out. So, you, you know, now, now you've got a baseline. Then you also take the height of your tanks because um, every foot of liquid, the water column, adds pressure to it. So if I want to put it at, you know, say 20 PSI, and I have my watering levels at, you know, a half a PSI, and then I've got X amount of feet. Um, so anyways, long story short, I'd set that gauge to, to hit that, that rate. Um, so you just turn on the carb stone. Generally between, you know, depending on the gravity of the beer, what I'm trying to do, I could carbonate a beer in three hours, three to four hours. Um, and th that would be done in a uni tank or a bright tank. 
So as a home brewer, especially in your keg, that would be more complicated. Um, I, we have done it where we've dropped it in on the gas line. And then we also sell a uh, Blickman's product that you know, you're oh, recirculating yep. through a stone called the quick carbonator. So that's another way you can do it. And the nice thing about it is you can kind of more dial in what pressure you're gonna get. The first two were kind of like, you gotta be tasting it, making sure you're getting close to it. But um, you, you maybe can't pinpoint and make it perfectly repeatable every time. Let's talk about perfectly repeatable every time as a home brewer though. And that's the fourth way, and it's the way I always recommend you carbonate your beer. If you don't need it in 48 hours, hopefully not often, let's say you need it in a week. That's the perfect amount of time because you go to that carb chart and let's say you are at 41 degrees and it says you put on 14 PSI, you put it on there and leave it. STP, standard temperature and pressure, you just leave it there for one week. Make sure your regulator is holding strong, make sure you're not having a gas leak, things like that. But you'll hit your saturation point probably in less than a week, probably in five days or so. But what's also awesome about a week is cold aging a beer for seven days trying not to draw too much. You might get a little sample here or there. That's the great part about a kegerator, but you almost get perfectly carbonated beer every single time. There's no risk of over carbonating because you're holding it at your 14 or 12, whatever PSI. So there's no chance of that over carbonation because that over carbonation sucks. Yeah, and like you mentioned, uh, leaving it upright like that, we're allowing it to basically settle out any proteins, things like that. Um, and then as you're pulling those samples, you're clearing out that bottom. So you've got if, clear if you're beer. using a traditional dip tube, if you're using, if you're using a floating dip tube, you're not. You don't even got to worry about that anyway. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if you've ever over carbonated your beer, you'll know what I'm talking about. For those who haven't yet, it's a nightmare. You go to pour it, and it's just all foam, um, and it, it's tough to deal with. And as a home brewer, there's a few ways to kind of deal with it, um, but let's talk professional first of what they do. How do you measure it? Yeah, so we use a device called a Zomnagel. Um, it, it measures, and, and you know, especially on the commercial side, if you're running a canning line and things like that, you cannot, or you can can over carbonated beer, but you're gonna waste a ton of it. It's just gonna be foaming out the top. Um, you know, like we said, tasting the beer is one good thing, rolling it over your tongue, but to measure it, you use a Zomnagel. It basically, you, you, you cool the device, put the liquid in there, shake it, and then w the pressure that comes out of solution is what it measures. So it says, hey, you're at 2.6 bar in that solution. So as a home brewer, what do we do? The, the, the best thing, probably the only thing we can really do is literally vent the keg. First thing, turn your CO2 down. Uh, I even unclick the CO2 in. Yeah, degas it. And degas it. Now don't leave it open, just degas it, come by again, degas it, come by again. I, I will do it every 15 to 20 minutes. Um, and you know, I let it go all the way, like, you know, this has gas on it, so, but I let it go all the way till you can't hear it. And then come by and do that again in 15 minutes and that's coming out the same way again, you know you're probably still over carbonated. And one, I guess, I mean, Zomnagel's an expensive uh, piece of equipment, but one thing they could do, just thinking about it, is put a spunding valve on there um, to see once they shake it, how much pressure, you know, I don't know, yeah. it's not as accurate, but you know, it's an, it gives you an idea of how much came out of solution. Yeah, I, that, that could work, especially after you've done that a few times yeah. to see. I, I get a little concerned personally about agitating beer. It's harder to pour when it's agitated. Um, so if you need it in a hurry, yeah. I would say your best bet is serving it as cold as humanly possible and um, relieving the pressure and even pushing in at first at a lower pressure, especially if you need it right away. You're having a party, people are coming over, um, and it's still gushing on you. Uh, that, that's a great point, the, the serving it as cold as possible, because we, we talked about it initially of, of uh, you know, CO2 at cold temperatures wants to stay in solution, higher temperatures wants to come out, right? So like that foaming, let's talk about foaming. We should probably have an entire discussion about what do we do when we foam? Yeah. That should probably be its own discussion. For sure, I think that is a good point. Thanks for watching. Next episode, we're gonna be talking about how to deal with foam, so be sure to subscribe and hit that notification button.